to call me to holiness. My neighbors have denied me the right to work, looked the other way when I was a victim of hate crimes, denied me and my partner the protections and benefits of marriage, sought to silence my voice in the church, and heaped ridicule and shame on my family. No matter their motivations, they have proven that they are not my friends. You cannot deny my basic human rights and expect me to consider you to have my best interests at heart. The stakes are much too high. Those who have sought to punish and oppress me have used the most powerful tool I know as a weapon against me. They have perverted the Holy Bible. The powerful standard of justice for even the most marginalized among us, the very touchstone of grace that offers hope and reconciliation, they have perverted the Bible into a tool of oppression. I am a Christian and a gay man. I am at perfect peace with God about the condition of my soul. I have prayed through many sleepless nights begging forgiveness for the sins that separated me from God and those around me. And I have found that forgiveness and I have changed with God's help. But as God and I have worked together through what it means for me to be gay, as I have studied the Bible and prayed and sought the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I have been given perfect peace about the fact that my sexual orientation is one of God's many gifts to me, and therefore to deny it is to deny the one who is its author and seeks its highest good through me. I have come to that peace not in spite of the Bible, but because I have studied it with reverence and found it to be a model of liberation and reconciliation, not a tool of terror. But if, having studied it and come to love it, I mostly run to the Bible now with confidence, it certainly was not always that way. I first studied Genesis 19 not out of love for the text, but out of a drive to survive. My hands shook when I turned the pages. And if yours don't, go back and read it again until they do. For though I found when I actually read the story that it doesn't have a thing to do with committed relationships like mine with my partner Mike, it speaks very powerfully to me as a person of privilege in America. Do you remember the story? Angels who look like men show up at Lot's house in Sodom, and Lot does what is required by his faith and the rules of community. He takes the men and feeds them. As they're eating, there comes a loud knock, a banging on the door. And when Lot goes to answer, <laughs> he sees the men of the city standing around his house. No women. There's no surprise there. Women have only in my lifetime begun to be sent out to war. And make no mistake, those men are out for blood. Bring those guys out here, they say, so we may know them. That sounds kind of benign, doesn't it? So we may know them. Lot can tell the difference. Scholars have argued about the Hebrew word that's used here, but the context of the story makes it clear that the men of Sodom intended to use one of the oldest tools of war to make sure those two visitors to their city and anyone else like them knew they were not welcome. They intended to rape them in public. There's a story that is almost the mirror image of this in Judges 19 and 20. Only the city is called Gibeah. Same scenario. Strangers, people we don't understand, people not like us, people not from around here, you might call them immigrants, are taken in by the householder and the men of the city show up demanding that they be turned over to them. The householder refuses but does precisely what Lot had done in the same situation. He offers his daughter to the men instead. Women, are your hands shaking yet? Unlike the men of Sodom, the men of Gibeah accept the householder's daughter and they rape her until she dies. They throw her dead body up on the steps. And the householder, hard to call him a father, cuts her up in twelve pieces and mails one piece to each of the twelve tribes of Israel. The tribes are so incensed at this horrible act of injustice, hard to just call it inhospitality, that they dispatch twelve armies to wipe Gibeah off the map. 
The sin of Sodom is not homosexuality. And the sin of Gibeah is not heterosexuality. Their sin was the same. Gross mistreatment of the stranger, the person not known or understood, and the horrid use of rape as an act of war. These were hate crimes. Crimes committed not just against the immediate victims, but perpetrated in order to send a message to everyone remotely like the victims. You are not welcome. You are not welcome. You are not welcome. And for these sins, Sodom and Gibeah were removed from the earth, but not from our history. I used to read Genesis 19 and Judges 19 and 20 and think they were good stories, but they didn't apply to me. But then I saw the pictures from Abu Ghraib prison. Men stripped naked and stacked on top of each other. Dog collars and leashes hanging from their necks. And a soldier, one of my neighbors from America, grinning stupidly beside them. And my hands started to shake. I dropped back to Leviticus and wrestled the holiness code for a blessing. Sometimes it's hard to take the holiness code of Leviticus 18 and 19 seriously. Are you going to give up eating shrimp and pork, wearing wool coats with cotton pants, and playing football in order to prove you're a good person? All those things are on the list of prescriptions that includes me lying with a man as with a woman. There are a lot of people who want me to live up to the holiness code, and I understand why. I understand the desire to live as a reflection of the love of God in a world that wallows in the dark misery of sin. I really do. I hear with power and resonance the teacher's command to the Israelites wandering in the desert to set themselves apart from the idol worshipers of the land to which they were going, to set themselves apart by not wearing the kinds of clothes the Canaanites wore, by not eating the local foods, or touching the dead skins of the unclean pigs that must have seemed nasty, abominable to sheep herders. And I surely understand a rule against copulating with homeless boys taken in as temple prostitutes by the priests servicing the Canaanite idols. Good children of Abraham that we are, we wouldn't want to do the things that might cause us to be mistaken for those who recognize any God other than the one true God. I get that. What I don't get is what any of that has to do with my love for my partner and the generative creativity of our shared life, or the ecstatic community we feel on the rare and sacred occasions when our bodies speak of love and trust and sacrifice and mutual care in language unutterable. But I do understand how unspeakably bad it is to value anything of this world more than we value the God who created it. The message of Leviticus 18 and 19 is that we must be willing to stand out in order to call the world away from idolatry. Here's what makes my hands and my heart quake. You and I have been called to ministry, whether lay or ordained, at a time of great ferment in the church we love. Most of the denominations that purport to represent Christ are in great thrall of a great idol called the unity of the church. They are heaping before its unblinking visage the bodies and souls of your lesbian and gay sisters and brothers in an attempt to satisfy what cannot be sated. The idol always wants more and never really gives anything in return. While over and around us weeps the God who requires only justice and mercy as acceptable sacrifices. I turn to Paul's letter to the Roman Christians. Ancient Rome was full of temples to fertility gods and goddesses. In those temples, priests copulated with adolescents. You know they were homeless kids with nowhere else to go. In hopes of ensuring good harvests and growth in populations threatened by disease and war. The lives, the feelings, and well-being of individual children were sacrificed for what was perceived to be the common good. 
And in the process, it became a commonplace of the pre 